Stanford University. Welcome then to lecture 14 of CS193P for to fall of 2013 and 14. Uh, today, uh, I'm going to talk about a little bit of miscellaneous topics, uh, UI application and network activity indicator, and then I'm going to follow up a little bit on the demo we did last time. Then I'm going to continue that demo, and we're going to take Photomania that we built last week, and we're going to make it work on the iPad, and we're going to add a popover uh, segue to it, because I talked about popovers a couple weeks ago, but I never showed you how to do it, and you know, all this stuff, if I just tell you about it, it's really not real probably for you until I show you how to do it, so we'll do a popover. And then we're going to dive into maps. So I'll be doing the lecture today on maps. Hopefully I'll get all the way through it. And then on Wednesday I will do a demo with the maps. And also then on Wednesday I will demo some more segues, especially the embed segue. Okay, so that's what we're talking about today. So let's talk about a couple of miscellaneous topics. So UI application is my first one. Uh, what is UI application? Sounds important. Um, it's not really that important. Uh, we dive right into using the application delegate last week where we did things like application did finish launching with options and you know handling background URLs coming in and background fetching and all that. That was all in the application's delegate. So the application's delegate is actually set by a property on another object called UI application. So UI application, this class, it only has one instance in your entire application. You get it by calling this UI application shared application. And there's really not a lot of really interesting stuff in this thing. You can go check out the, uh, the documentation, but all the real stuff is in the application's delegate. All right, so it has a property on your application called delegate. That gets automatically set for you. And then your application delegate object, which we did a lot in last uh, Wednesday, that's where all the action is. Okay, so you can check out a UI application if you want. Uh, I did want to point out one particular property on UI application, however, which is the network activity indicator visible property. This is a Boolean property. If you set it to yes, then the little spinner that shows up on the status bar. Have you ever seen that when you're doing network stuff? There's a little kind of spinner that's spinning. Um, that turns that on when your application is the active application. And uh, this thing, you know, it's Boolean, yes or no. That spinner's either on or it's off. It's totally your responsibility to turn this thing on and off. It's a little bit difficult to deal with because A, it's global. It's a UI application. So all the threads in your application are all using this same spinner. And number two, it's a Boolean. It's not like a push and pop or a count. And so imagine that you fire off a big flicker fetch. It's going to take 10 seconds. And you start the app, this network activity indicator, turn it to yes. Then in another thread, you fire off a little flicker fetch. It's only going to take one second. Okay? So it fires off. It turns this on. One second goes on. It finishes. It turns it back off. Now it's off, but the 10 second one is still running. Okay? So that's bad. So it's totally up to you, unfortunately, to put mechanism in your app for dealing with that uh, unfortunate simplicity of API. I'm sure, I mean, I don't know, but I'm guessing that Apple tried to put more complicated API on top of this, and it just didn't work for all different kinds of ways people you know, are doing network activity in different threads, so they just kind of said, okay, we'll give you this and we'll leave it to you. But you should turn this on. I'm not sure if Apple would reject an application submitted to the App Store that didn't turn this on and did do network activity, but they might, okay? And they'd probably be within their rights of doing it. Why do we have this thing? Because a lot of users might be on cellular and they only have 300 megabytes a month or something and they want to know when apps are using that up, right? So they want to see that little thing spinning. So that's why it's important to turn this thing on. Only when you're doing network activity. This is not a spinner for please wait. Okay, your app, sure, first of all, should never be doing please wait. As we know, we do everything off the main thread. But this is just to tell them network activity is happening even in the background in my app. Question back there. Is there a reason why um, iOS and desk you when you do network activity and turn it on on its own? Yeah, so the question is, can't iOS know that I'm doing network activity in my app and turn it on for me? And the answer is, I'll bet it could figure it out most of the time, okay? But not 100% of the time. Because when you do a network activity, you fire something off, maybe you're doing that URL session, things like that. I think if you do the, the URL session where it's actually being happening in another thread, I bet they do turn it on, or they might. I, I really don't know what they do. But I think the bottom line is they can't reliably 100% do it, so they're asking you, you can do it here. That's the best of my knowledge, that's the answer. 
Um, okay, so that was just a little aside. Uh, so now a little follow-up on our demo that we did last Wednesday. Two things that I want to clarify and that I did clarify if you downloaded the, the posted code and read the comments. One is, as I was going through my demo, sometimes I forget things, and I did forget this one line of code, which is you have to send a message if you want to get these background fetches to happen uh, to your shared application, your shared UI application called set minimum background fetch interval. Okay, so that interval is an NS time interval. It's the number of seconds that uh, would, is the minimum between the times that iOS will send you the opportunity to do a background fetch, right? So you're in the background, remember, the iOS can send you a thing that says, hey, wake up, you can do a background fetch if you want. And this says the minimum. Now, uh, this minimum, you can't set it to one second, and it's gonna wake you up every second because there's a UI application background fetch interval minimum. And that's the minimum you can set it to. And so if you want to set it to that, uh, then you'll get woken up as much as the system is willing to op op wake you up. Remember that's only the minimum. It could take much longer to wake you up, depending on what's happening. Uh, one thing about these background fetches, the system's quite smart about when it wakes you up to do a background fetch, it's probably waking a whole bunch of other apps that want background fetches too and doing it all at one time because all of this multitasking in iOS is all about saving the battery. Okay, why, you might ask, can't I have four apps on the screen at the same time? Well, that'd be a lot of processor, a lot of network activity, a lot of battery drain, okay? And so when an application's in the background and it's not running, we want minimum battery drain going on. So if it's gonna wake, and a lot of the battery drain is not necessarily what your app is doing, but it's just the fact that the phone or the iPad is awake, right? It's up and running, it's OS is running. So mostly the phone and the iPad are sleeping when you're not using it. Okay, so you want it to stay that way. So if you are gonna wake it up from sleep and start using battery, you wanna get as many apps going with their background fetches and all at once. Plus, there's a lot of very battery intensive things like the radio antennas, okay? The Wi-Fi and the cellular, those things use power. And so if you're going to do a background fetch, you're probably gonna fire up the Wi-Fi, that's gonna use power. We better get everybody who wants to do a background fetch doing it all at once. So this is just a minimum. Now, the reason I'm mentioning this is because the default is UI background fetch, uh, application background fetch interval never, which means you'll never get background fetch. So you definitely need to call this. It also notice means you have to run your application at least once. Your user has to run your application at least once and this gets called if you want background fetching to happen, right? Once you've called this, system knows you want to do that, uh, you know, it's gonna, once you, once you go to the background then after that, the launch, then it will, not only wake you up, but if you were to exit or crash, it'll fire you back up once it kind of gets you into the background fetch world. Um, users might find that they don't like your application running in the background because you use a lot of resources and your battery, their battery gets drained when they let you fetch in the background because you're a bad background citizen maybe. Um, they can actually go into settings and turn you off when it comes to background. Okay, there's actually a switch that says don't let Photomania or Shutterbug, fetch in the background. Don't, don't do it. And if you set that off, then you won't be able to do it. And you can find out if the user has done that using this property in UI application called uh, background refresh status. And it will return the refresh status. It actually has three different states. One can be you're good to go. Two can be the user turned you off. Third can be restricted. What restricted means, and you're gonna see this in various things. We'll see this with the map stuff. Uh, restricted means you can't do it, it's off, but your user didn't turn it off and they can't turn it back on, okay? Because they're restricted in some way. How would this happen? Parental controls, for example. It's possible in parental controls to make it so that this app is not allowed to run in background mode in parental controls, okay? Corporate environment. A corporation might not want to allow a certain app to run in the background because of what it fetches or whatever, okay? So you gotta check all three of those states. And if it's in that restricted state, not just this thing, but anything that's in a restricted state like that, you don't wanna to say to the user, I'm I wanna do background fetches, but you haven't turned me on, because then they won't be able to go turn you on, and they'll be like, what? Okay, they'll be confused. So uh, I just wanna make this a good opportunity to talk about those three states, right? Okay, it's on, it got turned off for the user, and it's restricted, meaning they, it can't be turned on. Question. Uh, the problem is if I want to uh, do something in the background, but I don't want to do a fetch. 
So the question is, what if I want to do something in the background, but not a fetch? And the answer is you can do that. This background fetch mechanism doesn't mean you can only fetch on the network. You can do other things. But it's called background fetch and all that, I think for a reason by Apple, is that they're kind of implying this is kind of what we imagine you're doing with this. So they don't really want you to wake up and then just use a lot of resources somehow doing something else. Uh, but you are allowed to do something else. So there's no law that says when the background fetch is called you couldn't make some mathematical calculation or something like that. Um, as you can imagine, what really would you be calculating mathematically? You kind of, when you wake up in the background, it's kind of like you want to check what's going on in the world. Okay? And we're going to talk about checking things like, where am I in the world? That's a different thing. There's another mechanism for that. We're going to talk about that. Yeah. Question. Is this like what, uh, let's say, like Facebook or Snapchat uses to know that like, someone sent you an email or whatever? So the question is, is this what you know, Facebook or some social media app that uh, you know, people are sending you messages, is this what it's using to say, someone sent you a message? Yeah, the little notification line. And the answer is no, this is not what it's doing. There's another mechanism for that called push notifications, which we're probably not going to get to talk about, unfortunately. Um, so that's how they're doing it. There is a way to basically have a user of an app sign up and say, with the server somewhere, saying, hey, I, I'm willing to accept push notifications from Facebook. And then the Facebook server can send notifications, little tiny JSON packets, basically, to the phone saying, oh, here's a message or something like that. And it, it, the message might be, uh, this guy's got a message. When you get those, there's a way to get woken up in the background. So it's a different mechanism for waking up in the background. However, if you're doing something, let's say you're in Reddit or even Facebook, and you have your little page up the last time you were in Facebook, and you want that to update. No one's sending you a message, per se, like not a Facebook messaging thing, but it's just like people are posting on their wall, you're watching, or whatever is going on. And you want that to, when you go to the app switcher, you want to see kind of what's happening there. Not in real time, but kind of, you know, that's what this would be great for. So wake up in the background, fetch the current contents of the page, Update it. Now if someone looks in the app switcher, they can quickly see, oh, I've got new stuff there. And they can go click and look. You see? So it's different kinds of things. But the sending a message, a notification, that's push notifications, which we're not going to talk about. Good question, though. OK, one other follow-up uh, from that demo is I kind of used a little demo where in that when we got the background fetch, when we got a chance to do a background fetch, I called start flicker fetch, OK, just to make it a one-liner there. That was almost a conceptual thing I was doing, just to kind of say, OK, we can have a chance to fetch. Let's do it. But actually, calling start flicker fetch there would not be good and probably would not work. OK, and why was that? That's because start flicker fetch starts a background session URL session. OK, background session meaning it's the kind of URL session that if the URL comes back and you're not running, you get a chance to handle it. Right, that whole handle URL background session, other one we looked at. Um, those kind of background session URL fetches are discretionary, okay? meaning that the system can determine, can decide, if you're in the background, I'm not even going to do that fetch. So those are fetches that generally you issue them in the foreground, they might complete in the background. Okay? When you get a chance to fetch, okay, because of this fetch thing, you want to do that fetch right there, using an ephemeral session like we did everywhere else in Shutterbug and stuff ephemeral normal session, not a background session. That way it won't be discretionary and it will actually do the fetch. And since the system is saying by sending you this message, okay, it's your turn to do a fetch. I fired up all the radios. I'm ready to do some network activity. Go ahead and do it. So the code that I posted after lecture last time is doing the right thing. It's doing actual fetch. So you can go take a look at the background fetch uh, message that gets sent by iOS, and you'll see that I'm doing an actual ephemeral fetch. I'm not calling start flicker fetch. I just want to make it clear why that code was different there. Question? So if you want to like, update a UI in the background so that the task manager shows the current view, um, how do we handle that in terms of using the main queue or not the main queue? Because we can't see UI things on the non-main queue, but in the background. Great, great question. OK, so the question is, uh, something's happening and I'm in the background and my UI gets, needs to get updated. Like a URL comes back or I get offered to do a background fetch. I'm doing all these things. And isn't there a problem there because I need to do all my UI in the main queue? That's the question. And that's a great question. But the answer is, when you're running in the background, you're not on a different queue. That background just means that 
you are not the app that the people are looking at. But every, otherwise, it's just like you're running in the foreground. You can draw, you can do everything, your main queue is running, okay? When you get the opportunity to run like this, it's your main queue that's running. So you can do graphics, you can do drawing, anything you want, right? So the difference between foreground and background is not main queue, some other queue. It's am I the active app, am I not the active app? That's the difference between foreground and background. Normally when you're in the background, you don't get to run. Okay? Your main queue gets no cycles because none of your app gets any cycles, okay, normally. But then occasionally you'll get the background fetch or a URL will come back or if you're a location thing, like I was saying we're going to talk about today, you can get messages that, hey, the phone has moved to a new location. Um, you get a push notification that you, I was talking about earlier, you know, Facebook sending you a message. Those things will wake you up in the background and you can get a little time to process. Anytime you're given an opportunity to run in the background a little, you only get a little bit of time understandably. You can't sit there and run for 10 minutes, okay? The whole point is to kind of keep you, when you're not the app that the user is using, we want to keep you, you know, not using a lot of resources so the battery doesn't drain, okay? So, good question. Yeah. If you do happen to start something that takes 10 minutes to finish, is the, is the system just going to cut off the processor just to pause you? So the question is, what if I get an opportunity to run in the background here from one of these many mechanisms, and I do start doing something that takes 10 minutes? What's going to happen? And the answer is, the system's going to just stop you. It's just your process is going to stop. Okay, so you're not going to get to finish. And that will create all kinds of bad things. Your user will be like, what's going on? You know, and you, it's bad for you. Things will time out if you're accessing the network. All kinds of bad things. Okay, so um, the answer is you don't want to do that. And the answer is the system will not let you do it. Good question. All right, anything else? Great question. This is a great slide because we got to basically talk about multitasking here. Okay. Um, all right. So let's talk about continue our photomania demo here. And uh, like I said, I'm going to make it into an iPad app. Actually, I'm going to make it a universal app. Okay. Believe it or not, and this is going to be a fairly short demo. And we've kind of built so much uh, reusable parts here and so much knowledge that you have that we can really quickly now make these apps do much more sophisticated things. And then I'm going to demo a new thing that you've never seen before, uh, which is how to make a popover segue. Okay? This is a new kind of segue. We talked about it in a lecture a few lectures ago, but I never asked you to do it on homework, and uh, I never demoed it, so I'm going to demo it here. Oh, yes. Okay, let's quit that. All right, so let's go run Photomania. So this is back to Photomania. This is exactly where it was when I posted it. Okay, so this is the posting, and you can see actually here's the perform fetch, and you see how I'm just doing a normal ephemeral uh, URL fetch. I'm not calling start flicker fetch here. And this guy is not, okay, it's, I know I just, okay. We'll deal with iTunes when we get there. All right, so, um, so anyway, so th but this is exactly what I posted last week, okay, last Thursday or whatever. So what did this do? Let's run this just so we can remind ourselves what Photomania does, it's been more than half a week. And there it is, it just fetches in the background and also when it launches, um, kind of a bunch of recent photos from Flickr and then it basically makes a table of all the photographers who took the photos. So these are all photographers, not photos, photographers. But we'd love to be able to click on these and see the photos by that photographer, right? But we can't, because we never put any segues in here, we never do anything. And plus, our app uh, doesn't work at all on iPad. In fact, let's go look at our iPad storyboard. You can see it right here. It's just this big blank screen. So if I ran this on the iPad, it would be just be a big blank screen. So let's get rid of that. Now, I want to build my iPad UI here, but I'm going to do it in a way that I showed you a little bit before, but it's really powerful, which I'm just going to copy and paste it from another app. Because Shutterbug, if you remember, had a, U a UI on the iPad that was very similar to what we want in Photomania. So I'm going to go over to Shutterbug. This is the Shutterbug as we last left it. And if you look at Shutterbug's iPad UI, this, it's kind of almost what we want. Shutterbug just shows the list of photos here. If we could just insert the list of photographers here in the middle, we'd have pretty much what we want on the iPad. So I'm just going to copy all of this. Go back over here to Photomania, and I'm in my iPad storyboard here, and paste. Oops, I guess maybe select all over here, and let's see, select all, copy, over here, and paste. Okay, so we put it in here. As usual, it's a little bit of a search party to find things. Oh, there it is. 
Um, so here is that Shutterbug um, uh, iPad UI. And like I said, basically I want to insert in between the list of photos a thing here where I can choose the photographer. The same thing, the thing I just showed you that we were running in Phot Photomania. Um, while I'm here in sh Shutterbug, let's grab the image view controller. We're going to need that, obviously. Our storyboard uses that, so we'll put that over here. Copy that in. And that's all we need from Shutterbug. So this, um, uh, this storyboard is pretty much exactly what we want. There's a couple of minor things we need to fix here. One thing is we don't want this list of photos to be the root view controller of our split view. We want the photographer thing to be that. So where can we get our photographer's table? Well, we actually have that too. That's here in our iPhone storyboard. That's what I just ran and showed you, right? This is the list. This table, if you inspect its identity, is this photographer's core data table view controller, right? So this is showing that list of photographers. So let's just copy this. Put this in our, oops. And where did it go? Oops, ah, er. sorry. It's sometimes hard to find all you. There it is, okay? Uh, notice that it looks really big. That's because I haven't segued to it yet, so it doesn't know that it's going to be in a um, master of a split view and, and be inside of a, a, uh, be inside of a uh, navigation controller like that. So let's go ahead and put that root view controller in there. Where is it? So here's the root of our navigation controller. Um, this thing is also probably called Shutterbug. Yeah, let's change this to Photomania or, or maybe Photographers because that's what's going to show up in our root view controller. So I'm just going to control drag to the photographer's one and reset that to be the root view controller. Okay, so now, get some more space here. All right, so now our uh, API or our UI is a little more what we want. Okay, we have this photographer's thing here and now what we want is each time we click on a photographer, one of these rows, then we want to go to a list of photos, right? So let's do that. So I'm just going to control drag from here to here. And this is inside a navigation controller, so I'm going to push. Okay, now we're really getting close to what we want. Okay, this says Shutterbug, but that's okay. It's going to be the title. We're going to reset that title anyway. And what's the problem with this UI? This UI is actually exactly what we want, except for one thing, which is that if we inspect this guy right here, it is a just posted Flickr photo CDTV, right? Because I copied it from Shutterbug, and that's what Shutterbug shows, right? The just posted photos. So really, we want this to be something like photos by photographer CDTVC, right? Because we're going to click on a photographer here, and we want this to show the photos by that photographer. Everyone understand what I'm, why I'm saying that? So let's just set it to be that, and we're going to have to create this view controller right here. So let's do that. File, new file class. It's going to be a core data table view controller. We're going to call it photos by photographer CDTVC. We've got to make sure that this equals this because I just set that to be the class um, in here. So let's put this, oh, might bring that. Let's put this in Photomania. Huh, that's kind of weird. Okay, well, all right, put it in there. All right. So here's our new Photos by Photographer Core Data Table View Controller. I'm going to not have you distracted by all this junk, so let's get rid of all that. When we create a new view controller, what do we do? We always kind of think of what is this thing's API, okay? What's its public interface? So let's look at the public interface of Photos by Photographer. And probably some of you are imagining that what this is. This is really simple. It's just going to be non-atomic strong we need to pass the photographer in that we want to show the photos of. So I better import, import photographer, and then I can have a photographer. Okay, so this is basically our public model. Our, this is our model, and it's public. And so if someone sets this uh, photographer, we better show the photos by that photographer. So this is a table that shows photos Photographer determines which photos we show. Okay, now before we go off and implement this, I'm actually going to go down to our photographer's core data table view controller. This is the thing that shows the list of photographers, okay, that I started off this lecture showing you. Hopefully you remember this code from last Wednesday. 
You can see that it's doing a fetch into the photographer, showing them by name. It's fetching all of them, right? I'm going to put in the navigation code to navigate from this photos one right here. This is the list of photos, right? Photographers, see, sorry, list of photographers. This little segue right here. So let's give that little segue a name. We'll call it the show photos by photographer segue because that's what it does, right? When we click on a photographer here, it's going to show the photos. And then let's go back to our photographer's core data table view controller and let's do the navigation. Now, I'm going to show you something that I think you should probably do for your uh, development process, which is to start use code snippets. Now, we talked about this in one of the Friday sections, so I'm not going to go over it again, but I have a code snippet that I've created, for example, which is a kind of generic table view navigation code snippet. So I start typing the, what I called it, table view navigation, and I'm going to hit return, and it's going to put it in. So it put this code in here for me, and this is fairly generic. Okay, and what does it do? Well, it does prepare for segue, and it also does did select row at in index path. Okay, so this is this can work for a table view that is the master of a split view, and it will also work for something that is just going to segue via navigation controller or whatever. So how does it work? Well, for prepare for segue, it just gets the index path from the sender, which is a UI table view cell. You've already seen this code before, so it's nothing new. And then it calls this prepare up here, and we'll talk about what the prepare does in a second. And then the did select row at index path, it does the trick where it's looking at the detail controller of the split view. If it's a navigation controller, it looks inside of it for its root view controller, and then it's preparing that. Okay, everyone understand what these two methods do? Okay, so now we got to look at this prepare, because this is the thing that's actually doing the prepare. So here's that. And what this is going to do, it's going to get the managed object in the row in the table that we're talking about, okay? And then it's going to check the class of the view controller we're segueing to. Maybe it's going to check the segue identifier as well. That's not going to be, a, you know, did select row and index path is not a segue, so it's not going to be applicable there. But I check here to see if there is a segue identifier. And if there's not, then I ignore this part. And then I'm going to prepare that view controller for being segued to or if it's the detail of the split view controller, okay? So this case, we have photographers segueing to photos. So let's see what this looks like. Well, the NS Manage object we have here that we're going to be looking for is a photographer. So I'm just going to replace this with photographer, photographer. Okay, just getting my object in index path out of my fetch results controller. You know what that is. And then what kind of view controller are we segueing to? Well, we're going to be segueing to one of these photos by photographer core data table view controllers that we just created. We haven't done the implementation of this yet, but we know what its public API is to set the photographer, which is exactly what we would want. So let's go ahead and import that. Import M, import photos by photographer. And then let's go down here and check that that's the class, photos by photographer. Okay, so now we know that that's uh, the class that we want. Here, uh, the segue identifier, we can check that here. And if you remember, I set it to be show photos by photographer, right? That's, everyone know what that is, right? That is this thing right here, this little segue, okay? Its identifier is this. That's got to match what we're doing in here. All right. So we're checking that. And again, if we're doing the did select row and index path case where it's just the detail view, then the segue identifier is going to be nil. So its length is going to be nil. And so I use length there just to case for, check for empty string and nil equally, either of them. And I'm doing not. So if there's no segue identifier, then as long as uh, we're going to a photos by photographer CDTVC, then we know we're going to what we're going to do. Now, some people would argue that checking this segue identifier, that you should almost never do that, okay? Because if you're segueing to a photos by photographer CDTVC from a photographer CDTVC, you know what you're doing. You don't need a segue identifier to tell you what you're doing. That's what some people would say. And I see that argument. It's not a bad argument. I, I even buy that argument that really you only want to use segue identifiers if for some reason you had two different segues. And we'll talk a little bit later in this demo an example of where you might actually have that. So one could argue just delete that. Okay, just get rid of that entirely. Don't even check that. And 
here we know that this is a it's photos by photographer CDTVC, photos by photographer CDTVC equals photos by, whoops, photos by photographer CDTVC star VC. All right, so we have that. So now we're going to prepare the, the, this view controller, photos by photographer dot photographer equals the photographer that was selected in our row. Okay? Uh, yeah, we'll talk about that. So the question is, don't I have to pass the context to this new uh, controller? And the answer is yes, and I'm doing that in this line of code right here. So let's go look at uh, photos by photographer. Okay, so here's photo by photographer. It's going to get this photographer. What do we need to do in photos by photographer? Well, really the main thing we need to do is fetch the photos by that photographer. So let's go ahead and look at that. Um, every time I set the photographer, and you're noticing, by the way, anytime you have a public model setter, you're almost always going to use the setter to update your view when someone sets your model. That's kind of an obvious thing. Uh, one thing I might do here, by the way, is set my title to be the photographer's name. That would be a good thing, right? I'm, I'm a controller that's showing a bunch of photos by a photographer, so my title might want to be that. Um, but the real thing I need to do here is set up uh, my fetched results controller. That's the main thing that CDTVCs need to do is set up their fetch results controller and then they kind of just work automatically, right? So uh, to save some time, I have that ready to go here. This is what it looks like. Let me, I'm going to go through every line of this, don't worry. Um, so first is answering your question, how do I get my context? I need a context, I can't fetch without a context. And the answer is I'm just going to ask the photographer what context it's in. Okay, someone gave me a photographer and I'm going to go find out what the context is from it. That photographer came from some database. I want to get the photos in the same database. Okay? So I don't need to pass the context separately. It comes along with the photographer. If the context is nil, so either the photographer is nil or for some weird reason the photographer didn't come from a context, that's impossible, but uh, mostly this would be the photographer is nil, then I'm going to set my fetch results controller to nil. That blanks out my table. If you set your fetch results controller to nil, then your table's going to be blank, which is what I want in, that, in this case if someone gives me a photographer with no context or gives me a nil photographer. But otherwise, I'm going to set up a fetch request uh, for all the photos where my predicate is who took equals that photographer. Okay, everyone understand that line of code? Hopefully, if you started on your homework, then you understand it. And then I'm going to show, uh, sort the photos by the photo's title. So they're going to be in alphabetical order by the title of the photo. So this is a property on photo, if you'll recall. And we're going to sort by that. Use this kind of finder-like sorting order. And then that's it. I just create this fetch result, self .fetch results controller. It's got the request right here that I just created and the context, which I got from the photographer. And I'm not doing any sections and there's no caching. Any questions about that? Hopefully everyone understands that from last time. All right, now what else does this photos by photographer table need to do? Well, not much else, okay? By setting the fetch results controller, it's getting the results, but it has to display those results. So it has to do self or row at index path. Okay, that's the one thing that core data table view controller cannot do for you because it doesn't know what attributes of the object you want to show in the rows. So you got, we got to do that. The other thing it needs to do is navigation. Because when I click on a photo, I want to have that image view controller show its image. Right? So it needs to do those two things. But I'm not going to put those in this class. Okay? Why am I not going to put these in the class? Because those two things, every core data table view controller that shows photos wants to do. Okay? Every single one of them. So I'm going to create a generic photos core data table view controller that knows how to do that. All right? And then I'm going to have this class inherit from it. So I'm doing this to really emphasize, because a couple of you few of you are still struggling a little bit with this concept of using object-oriented design to build your controllers. Okay, so we're going to do it again right here. So I'm going to create a new controller. Okay, it's going to be a new core data view controller. It's going to be called Photos Core Data Table View Controller. And its job in life is to show a bunch of photos. Okay, so let's do that. Let's find out what its public API is. Okay, here's its public API. This turns out to have no public API because all you need to do to make this thing work is hook up fetched results controller to any photo fetch request. Okay, this thing is a core data table view controller, so it has this fetched results controller thing. 
as long as you set that fetch results controller to any photo request, then this jo the job of this class is going to be to display it and let you navigate from it as well. Okay, generic. It'll work for any photos. Doesn't even you don't even have to set anything except for the fetch results controller. All right, so look, let's look at this guy's implementation. Pretty straightforward here. Doesn't need any of this. All right. So here we got to just implement those two things, self at index path and navigation. So let's look at um, self at index path. Looks like this, table view self at index path. And of course, we'll just get the cell. Okay, this code should be very, very familiar to you. Go to the table view, we DQ. Okay, I'm gonna call this photo cell. Now, it's interesting, this is a generic class and it's using photo cell as its reuse thing, so I probably want to put that information into its public header file. So I'm probably here, I'm going to say use photo cell as your table view cells reuse ID. Okay? That way anyone who's using my class doesn't have to go look at its implementation, they can just get this information from the header file and do it. So let's make sure we do that. Let's go back here. Here's our photos by photographer cell. Let's see what its cells reuse identifier is. And the answer is, ooh, Flickr photo cell, because we stole this from Shutterbug. And Shutterbug is a Flickr thing, whereas we are a core database thing. So I'm going to get rid of that word Flickr and make sure that this is what it's supposed to be, photo cell. OK? You understand that? So back to here. So now I've got this photo cell. OK? Um, what am I going to do with it? Well, I need to get the photo that I'm supposed to show in this cell. So that's photo star, and of course we need to import photo. Photo equals self.fetch results controller, object at index path, the index path. Okay, this argument right here. This hopefully is completely, we understand this. Now I just need to set the text label. I'm going to set its text to be the photo's title, and let's set the detail, this is the subtext, subtitle thing, to the photo's subtitle, and return the cell. Okay, so you can see that writing cell for row and index path is pretty easy when it's a core data table view cell, because usually the object in the row, which you can get with one line of code, has what you want, you just display it. Okay. Now let's talk about the navigation. I told you I had this generic table view navigation thing. I'm going to use it again right here. Okay, so it's the exact same thing that I put in the other one. I just have to make sure this is appropriate to what we're doing here. So this is photos again. So the managed objects are going to be photo star photo. Okay, so now I got the photo out of the row. What does this thing do in terms of navigation? Well, it will navigate to an image view controller and show the image. All right, so let's import image view controller because that's what we're going to be navigating to. Okay, get down here kind of class image view controller. Again, I could probably skip the segue thing here, because if I'm navigating to an image view controller from this photos view controller, I almost certainly want to show my image. There's not really nothing else I might want to do. So we'll just do that. So image view controller IVC equals image view controller VC. And we just need to set the IVC's image URL equal to an NS URL with the photos image URL. The reason I have to do this, of course, is that you can't store an image URL in the database. We stored it as a string. So this converts it into a URL because image view controller takes a URL as its public API. I could also do something here, title equals the photo's title. Okay, because really the image view controller, it, since it only has an image URL, it doesn't really have enough information to set its own title like the other one did, the photographer, uh, the, this, like this one, um, this guy's subclass that we created, it knew how to do it, but this one already can't, so we'll, we'll help it out, set its title. Okay? Everyone understand that? So now we have this nice generic photos showing uh, thing. Let's go ahead and make our photos by photographer inherit from it instead. Photos CDTVC. Photos CDTVC. Okay, so now it just inherited the ability to do self row index and navigation. Okay, and it still does the fetch itself. So it's the one determining what photos show up. It's super class is the one putting them in the rows. Everyone understand what I'm doing there? Okay. Okay, so that's awesome. So everybody kind of knows how to uh, 
to navigate. Everyone knows how to load themselves up. And uh, maybe that's all we need to do. Let me see if I remember anything else. I think that's it. So let's go see if we're working. Let's, let's try this on the iPad because we just built, oops, let's do it on the real iPad. Uh, we just built this, so let's go ahead and do that. Let's see what, if we have any bugs, things not working. Maybe we didn't forget, we didn't set some of our segues right or something like that. So we can see what's going on here. So here it's Photomania, so hopefully it's fetching from Flickr right now into this photography table, and it is, that's very good. So here we have photographers, right? That's what Photomania does. Shutterbug fetched the photos and showed you the photos titles. Uh, Photomania fetches the photos and then shows you the photographers. Then we can look and see some photographers have three photos, some nine. So let's pick this guy, he has nine. Uh, let's pick this guy, he has three. And we can click on one of these. Again, hopefully nothing, uh, this is Rio de Janeiro. Maybe let's pick somewhere else, how about that? No, that's no titles. Uh, how about this one? No, that's no titles. Uh, okay, we'll do Rio. Hopefully Rio is not going to do anything bad. Here we go. There's Rio. Oh, good. Not bad. Okay, so there's our image view controller. So this all worked great. So hopefully it works uh, here in uh, portrait mode too, and it does seem to be working there too. Okay. Oh, we could go there. Okay. So there we go. Um, so that's that. Okay, you guys all got that. Uh, it worked perfectly. So now we can quickly move on to the next thing we're going to show, uh, which is we're going to show how to put a little, put it in landscape mode to show here. Um, so like right above where this duck's nose is, okay, I'm going to put a little button called URL. And when I click on it, it's going to do a popover. And in that popover, it's going to show me the URL that's showing here, the text of it, you know, HTTP slash something, okay? So, this is mostly to show you how to do popovers. So let's look, go back and see how we would do that. It turns out to be quite straightforward. So here we are, here's our UI. And what we want to do is add a little button here that does the URL. Okay, so we're going to drag this bar button item into the bar here and we're going to call it URL. Okay, so this is going to be a bar button item that when we click on it, it's going to bring up a popover here, a little view that, or view controller that's going to appear uh, overlapping everything else. So uh, how do we do that? And the answer for that is that uh, we create an entirely new view controller. Okay, a pop-up, pop-over segue is a normal segue. You segue to a new view controller. So we're going to create a new view controller that's going to display the URL that's showing here in the image view controller. All right, so how do we create a new view controller? You all know how to do that. We go into here. We go up to the top, we grab a view controller, and we drag it out. Okay? Now this view controller is quite big. Let's make it so we can see it a little better. So here's our view controller. So this is the view controller that's going to pop over. Okay? And we then just create a segue by control dragging. So I'm holding down control and dragging, just like any other segue. And this is going to be a popover segue. So this is the first time we've ever done popover. Okay? Now, once you create a popover segue, uh, you can now kind of create this view controller however you want it to look to pop over. And one of the things you might want to set is its size. Because if this is our popover size, that's not going to be good. It's going to cover our whole screen. That's going to be horrendous. So to display a URL, we only need it to be small. And I, it's nice to have URL in one line so it's not wrapping because URLs have all those slashes. So let's try to make a really wide one that will hopefully fit in one line. So how do we change the size of a view controller? Okay, because all our other view controllers have kind of inferred their size using these simulated metrics right here. You see this inferred size? But a pop-up view, con a pop-up reverse controller is special in that you can change its size Notice that you won't be able to do this until Xcode knows that this is a pop-up view, pop-over view controller, or at least knows that this view controller is going to be in a pop-over context because of this segue right here, this pop-over segue. Once you do that, if you go to your view controller and select its view, its self.view, then you can go dimensions and these will be editable, the width and height. So for example, we can make this 600 wide and maybe 40 pixels high, okay? which is probably a pretty good looking thing. So that means when we press this URL button, it's going to pop over and going to be something like that. That's a pretty good size. 600 is the widest they will allow you to make a popover. Okay? So it, I think if you specify more than 600, it's, just gonna, it's only going to show up 600. 
right? And you can make it any height you want, although obviously you wouldn't want it too big to cover up all the content underneath. It doesn't really make a, pop a popover that would cover up everything. You would want to use a different kind of segue, a modal segue in that case. Um, so we have this. Um, and then this is just another, a normal view controller otherwise, this little view controller thing. So we need to create a subclass of view controller to be its subclass. So let's do that. And what does this view controller do? Well, it's a normal UI view controller. And uh, it displays a URL. That's all it does. So I'm going to call it URL view controller because that's what it does. It displays a URL. Okay. We'll put it in the place we usually put it. Actually, let's put it down here, eh, somewhere like right here. Uh, what's its public API? Very simple. Property, not atomic, strong. And that's URL, the URL. That's the URL it's going to display. Okay. What's its implementation? Also really, really easy. Let's get rid of this. It's going, when you set its URL, it's going to update its UI. Now, this is not a table view controller, so we're going to have to write the update UI. Uh, also, when its view did load happens, also wants to update its UI. Don't forget this part. Okay, when you have non-table view, uh, table view controllers, this set URL might be called before your outlets are set. Okay, so update UI might do nothing because you have no outlets, right? So you want to do it again in view did load. This is very inexpensive to do, so I'm just going to do it possibly twice. If someone were to set this and my outlets were set and then view did load happened after that, it might happen twice, but it's very inexpensive to update my UI. Um, so I can do that. So we need to uh, write update UI. To update UI, we need a UI. So let's go back to our storyboard and give this thing a UI. And what I'm going to do for this UI is just drag out a text view. So I'm going to go down here. Find a text view right here. We, we saw a text view from before, so I'm going to put the text view in here. I'm going to yeah, line it up. Let's go ahead and uh, get its uh, auto layout going. So I'm going to reset to suggest a constraint. So I'm going to check to see if it did something good, which it definitely did. You see that it's going to stick to the size of its super view. I like that. Um, let's inspect the text view. I don't want all this code. I'm going to put like HTTP slash slash www.stanford.edu okay in there and uh, that looks terrible let's make it a little bigger 18 point that looks better let's uh, make it be centered uh, let's make it be selectable but not editable so someone could select this and then copy and paste it into their browser and look at it that way so that's good we definitely like that um, so that looks pretty good that, that's pretty good looking view of URL or URL and so now let's go ahead and wire this up to an outlet. Um, notice that when I do that, it's trying to do UI view controller. Why is that? That's because we need to set the identity of this thing to be a URL view controller. This, right, they thought it was a general view controller. As soon as I do that, you can see that now it understands that this is a URL view controller. So I'm going to go ahead and drag to create an outlet to that text view. I'll call it URL, URL text view. There it is normal IB outlet. Um, let's go ahead and go full screen on the code here, like that. And now we can do our update UI, which is that let's just have our URL text views text be the uh, URLs. It, it's a path, basically. And there's a method in URL called absolute string, which will return an, the absolute path of that URL. Sorry, self.url. Uh, the absolute path as a string, which is what we want because text is a string. Okay, and we could do a lot more fun things attributed text here. You could set fonts, colors, whatever. But we're just going to do a very, very simple update UI. So now we have this URL view controller, okay, that we're going to segue to, right? This is a segue. We are segueing. Oh, man, I should put my doc somewhere else. Um, we are segueing from this view controller, which is an image view controller, right, to this which is a URL view controller via this segue right here. Okay, so let's go ahead and give that segue a name. We'll call it show URL. That's probably a good name for it. Okay, and then let's do the prepare for segue for this. That's the last piece we have to do. So how are we going to prepare for this segue? It's a normal segue. This image view controller is where it happens, right? That's where the UI is, so that's where we have to put the uh, 
prepare for segue, so we're going to do that. Let's put it right down here. So I'm going to put a nice pragma mark navigation. And I'm just going to do void prepare for segue. And so here I'm just going to say if the segues destination view controller is kind of class a URL view controller. Okay, then I'm going to uh, segue to it. And yeah, I could also say if the identifier equals show URL, but uh, for speed here, we're just going to go ahead and not do that. View controller class. Okay, so now I have the URL view controller. URL VC equals URL view controller. Uh, the segue.destination view controller. Okay, I've got the URL view controller, and I can just set the URL view controller's image, or sorry, URL to be my image URL. I am an image view controller. So image view URL happens to even be my model, right? So I have it handy dandy, and so I'm just going to set that. Okay, so now I'm totally prepared to segue to this thing. So let's go ahead and uh, give this a try and see if it works. Okay, so uh, let's pick a photo here. Let's pick a better one than that. Let's pick one here. Okay, let's go back to Rio de Janeiro. Okay, there we go. So what is the URL for this? It's going to be some Flickr URL. So we click on URL, and it shows it to us. Some farm, some server farm at Flickr. Excellent. Now, this looks like, oh, good, it's all working. But actually, there's a problem here. Watch, watch this. I'm going to press the URL button again. Oh, the smog is building in Rio here. Look at how, oh, it's getting, so it can't even see. What's happening there? Actually, that segue is happening over and over. It's putting up more and more popovers. So there are actually four or five popovers all on top of each other. That's why it's getting darker and darker, because the popover kind of darkens the rest of the screen and puts it up. So if I click somewhere else, which is how you dismiss a popover, it's slowly getting rid of them all, all the way back to the other one. Well, needless to say, this is not a great UI <laughs> for the user. So we don't want this, okay? Why is this, how are we gonna stop this? Well, we're gonna stop this when this segue when someone clicks on URL, we are going to check to see if we already have a popover up. And if we don't, if we do, we're not going to do that segue. So let me show you how to do that. So first of all, we have to keep track of whether this popover is up. So I'm going to do that by adding a property here to my image view controller. I'm going to make it weak. This is one of the first times that we've used a weak property outside of outlets. Okay, but it's going to be a UI popover controller. URL popover controller. And the reason it's going to be weak is because I want to use the weakness so that when the popover controller is gone, no one else will have a strong pointer to it. My pointer will get set to nil. Get it? So now I'm always going to know whether that popover controller uh, is up. But I've got to set it initially, though. I've got to set this thing to the popover when the segue happens. OK, so let's do that. And how do we do that? Uh, I said this in the slides, but probably you're probably like, what? But now you'll see it, which is uh, this segue, if this is a popover segue, will be a subclass of UI Storyboard called UI Storyboard Popover Segue. Okay? Popover Segue equals UI Popover Storyboard Popover Segue. Segue. Now, I could just do this. But I'm going to be a little safe and say if my segue is kind of class, UI popover, storyboard popover segue class, okay, then I'll get it. Then I'll do this. I just don't like to do casts like that without you know, checking first. Although if I got to here, probably is going to be a popover, but you know, it should be a popover, but I'm going to check anyway. And now I'm just going to set my URL popover controller equal to that popover segues popover controller property. If you look at popover segue, here's popover segue. I'm going to go to its documentation, okay, for UI storyboard popover. And you'll see that UI storyboard popover only has one property, which is the popover controller. Okay? So we're basically getting the popover controller from the segue. It's a special kind. Okay? So it's a little hopefully you understand that. Everyone understand that? Question? No? 
Um, it's not, this is not the destination view controller. This is the Segway itself. Okay, we're not saying Segway.destination view controller here. Okay, great question. Is the destination view controller, this thing, is that a popover controller? And the answer is it is not. It is a URL view controller. Okay, popover view controller is another class, not a UI view controller, that controls that popover. Okay, so it is not. So the Segway is a storyboard popover segue out of which we get the popover controller and the destination view controller is a URL view controller. Everyone got all that? All right, so now we have a pointer to this URL popover controller and it's automatically going to get set to nil as soon as it goes off screen because it's weak. This is a weak pointer to it. There's only one other thing we need to do which is not do this segue if that thing is up. And I actually talked about this in a lecture, how we do this. There's a method in UI view controller called should perform segue with identifier. Okay? And this is the system asking, someone clicked on something that's supposed to cause a segue. Should I do it? And right here we're going to say, if the segue in question here, its identifier, is equal to string show URL, which is what it is in our um, in our storyboard, and that's, this is a reason why maybe we want to check it here as well. Okay, I skipped over that in demo mode, but you know, if we're going to check it here, we might want to check it up here as well. Okay, but anyway, we got this. I'm going to return in this case, so if it's a URL, then if I have a URL popover controller, then no, do not perform this segue, because there's already a popover up. Otherwise, I could just say yes, but actually I'm going to do something a little trickier. I'm going to say, if I have a U image URL, then put it up. Otherwise, also don't put it up. See what I did there? Two reasons not to put, do that URL segue. If I don't have any photo showing, then that's one reason. Other, otherwise, or if I have a pop-up already up. Else, now this is interesting, I have an else case here, which is super should perform. Okay, so if I don't, if I'm not preventing it, then I'm going to let my super class, UI view controller, decide whether it should do this, UR, this segue, which it's always going to say yes, pretty much. But okay, this should be returned. Okay, so let's see if that fixes all our problems. All right, so let's go back to Rio. Here we are in Rio. Let's click URL. Excellent. URL again, 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 again. It's not doing it. Click away. Good. Fix all our problems. Okay. There is a subtle problem still here, which I'm not going to fix because time. I need to get to the maps here. But if I go to portrait mode and show the URL, watch what happens if I click photographer over here to show those photographers. Oh, the URL thing didn't go away. I thought if I clicked away from it, it's supposed to go away. And the answer is if you click in the same bar, that the URL thing is, then it does allow you to click. That's the thing in the slides that I talked about called pass-through views. So this whole bar is part of the pass-through views. And the real bad thing about this is if I click on a different photo, it's showing me a different photo, but it's not updating the URL. So this is really bad. So I'm going to fix this in the code I post. Actually, let's just fix it right now. Easier to show you. I'm going to do this. Whenever someone sets my image to something new, Okay, call set image. I'm going to, this is in my image view controller, I'm going to dismiss any popover controller that I have. Okay, so that way if someone brings up that thing on the right and they click, at least I'll put away my URL. Okay, I could actually have some code here that updated the URL view controller and made it change. That wouldn't be that hard. I would just keep, it tr keep track of it. The only problem is that would be then inconsistent between this portrait mode and this mode, because here when I'm click, if I had URL up here, if I click over here, it makes the URL go away, okay? Because this is, over here is now no longer in the same bar as the URL. So I want my behavior at least to be somewhat consistent. So I'll make it so that when I click on something new, it makes the URL go away, okay? Okay, nice big long demo. I will, of course, post all of this. Now you know how to do popover controllers. You should really have a good handle on using those core data table view controllers by now, I hope. Oh, I promised I would do a universal app. Look how easy this is. Okay, I'm going to do my iPhone by just, here's my iPad. I'm going to take this, copy it, 
go over here to my iPhone 1, get rid of this thing, paste, okay, go back to iPad, get this image view controller, which I need, uh, put, go over here, paste it, if we can find space for it, paste, fine, there it is, put it up here, just need to make the segue to it, control, drag, it's a push segue, boom, we're done, now iPhone will work. Okay? You can come up after class if you want to see it working, but that's all there is. So a lot of times when you're working on an iPhone and iPad UIs, you'll get one working, then you just copy and paste back to the other one. You get that one maybe working with some new feature, copy and paste the appropriate things back to the other one. See what I mean? You can kind of go back and forth between pretty, pretty straightforwardly. Okay, back to the slides. Here we go. Lecture 14, there it is. Okay. So we're not going to get all the way through the maps stuff today, which is fine, because I have a little bit of time at the beginning of the next lecture, and then I'm going to be doing the map uh, demo in the next lecture anyway, so it'll be kind of fresh in your mind. So any questions about all that big demo I just did? It all sounds good? It's understandable? Okay. All right. Map kit. So basically, I'm going to be talking about map kit here, but before I talk about map kit, I have to talk about another framework, which is a non-UI framework which kind of underlies the MapKit framework called Core Location. So Core Location is a framework, has a bunch of objects in it that have to do with where is this device in the universe, okay? Where on the planet, what, you know, where in terms of GPS or other factors determining where it is, where is it, okay, where on Earth? So um, its basic object is a CL location that includes a coordinate, which is, you know, latitude and longitude, Altitude, okay, horizontal and vertical accuracy. We'll talk about why that's important. Timestamp, speed, course, things like that. Okay, that's the CL location object. Um, this object uh, has this very important property called coordinate, and that is a C struct, CL location coordinate 2D, and inside is just CL location degrees, which is essentially a double, which is latitude, and another one is longitude. Okay, and then the altitude is in meters. Okay, so that, this is the basic object in core location. So the question is, how do uh, some, oh, sorry, let me talk about accuracy, very important. So um, when you get a location, you got it in a certain way that might have varying accuracy. If you got that location from GPS, it could be very accurate. If you got it by looking at local cell towers, it might be pretty inaccurate, right? It could be a mile off, actually. Um, if you got it that way. And there's ways in between. On Stanford campus, you, you can actually get it by using Wi-Fi. It can look around, see what Wi-Fi things are near you, and tell by that where you are. Kind of scary, huh? So it knows where you are. And that works even if you're indoors or whatever. So um, uh, now it only works for public Wi-Fi nodes, et cetera, but at Stanford, these Wi-Fi nodes are all well known, so it knows where you are. Um, and you specify this accuracy using one of these KCL location accuracy constants. And so there's best for navigation. If you want that kind of accuracy, that's going to use your battery because it's going to be constantly doing GPS. So that would be only if your phone is plugged in, like you're in your car and it's plugged into the cigarette lighter or whatever. Uh, I guess they have USB ports nowadays in cars. But anyway, uh, you would want power there. Then there's best, which is also GPS, but not quite as power hungry. And then all the way down using Wi-Fi and these other things to less and less accuracy. But however the location was found, it will also report to you what accuracy it used, okay? Both in terms of horizontally and then altitude-wise vertically. Um, understand that accuracy means power. The more accuracy you ask for, the more power you're going to use, okay? So ask for the least accuracy your application can deal with so that you use as little power as possible. Very important point. Okay, uh, some other properties there, I'm not really going to talk about them, you have the slide for them, obvious things, speed is calculated by seeing all the points that you're moving through time and it can calculate your speed, uh, things like that. Um, so how do you get one of these core location guys? Okay, I want to get a correlation, core location object that says where I am right now. And the answer is you use this class called CL Location Manager. Okay, so you instantiate a core location manager, CL location manager, and you're going to set some things up about it, and then you're going to tell it to start telling you where you are. And it's got a delegate, and it will start telling that delegate where you are. So that's basically how it works. Now, you can simulate where you are, by the way, in the debugger. 
with this little thing down by the um, debug uh, bar, place where the pause and all that. You can just simulate where you are. You can even add places that you are if you want to, like I have a whole series of locations that you want to check running through to see if your application is working. So this is a really cool way to simulate uh, being somewhere. Um, all right, so CL Location Manager, how do we use this thing to get our location? You create it, you check to see what hardware you have because every different device, iPhones 4s, iPhone 5s, iPads, have different hardware in them for figuring out where they are. And so you're going to check to see what, what's available. Then you're going to uh, add, set this delegate to be any object you want. And then you're going to configure it for what kind of location updates you want, accuracy, things like that. And then you're going to start it running. And it's going to start reporting to you um, where you are. So what kinds of location monitoring are available? There's accuracy-based uh, reporting. Okay, So that's, you specify an accuracy, and it'll tell you to that accuracy where you are. Okay, uh, There's updates that you can get where it'll send you a message only when a significant change in position has happened. Okay, Imagine maybe it's using cell towers or something there. Okay, Or if Wi-Fi is fired up for other reasons, it might be able to be using Wi-Fi, right? but it's probably not going to use GPS. Okay, So only to tell you when significant changes occurred. You also have region-based updates. Put a little circle around the dry cleaners. When you walk by or drive by, it'll tell you, oh, you're by the dry cleaner. Okay, so that's region, and you can set up a little region, circular regions, beacons, we'll talk about those. And then you can also monitor your heading. Okay, so wh which way am I walking? Okay, and that might be using a compass, might be using just GPS, it just depends on what the device has. So the first thing I said was, you got to check the capability. So here's a whole bunch of methods, I'm not going to go through them for time reasons, but you need to check these, okay, uh, because, for example, a user might have turned off location services for you. Okay, so you got to know, you got to deal with that. Either ask them to turn it back on. Again, there's this restricted thing for this too, um, uh, or whatever you want to do, or do some different thing in your app. If you work without those location updates on or whatever, you might be on a device that doesn't have the hardware you need to do what you want. So this, you need to all check all this. Okay, when you first create your location manager. Um, so then, getting it, uh, you can ask a location manager, "Where am I right now?" Okay, kind of pull it. We never do that. We use this delegate thing. So let's talk about how the delegate thing works. First, you specify the accuracy. Okay, This is a location manager property, desired accuracy. I showed you the accuracies before. Specify that. And then also you can specify a distance filter. In other words, until the user use, moves at least this far, don't even tell me. Okay, So if they don't go at least 100 meters or a kilometer, don't tell me uh, about it. So that saves battery too. The chip, the GPS chip, in these devices, especially the newer ones, really awesome. A lot of this stuff that you specify here gets loaded into the chip, and the chip by itself is calculating where you are and whether you went far enough and all that stuff, and then waking the phone back up. The whole phone can sleep, and the GPS is still watching. And so if you can tune these to be as minimal as possible, you will save a ton of battery in the device, because only that GPS chip will be watching you know, what's going on. Uh, okay, so then you start getting the updates by just calling start updating location, and your delegate will start getting sent messages based on the accuracy and the filter that you specify for distance, okay? What does that uh, delegate method look like? Location manager did update to location from location is one of the ones. There's actually some other ones that you could get sent, so you want to check the documentation on this one. Um, but this is the basic one where it's saying, okay, I got a new location, here it is. That location, of course, will have accuracy and all timestamp, all these other things in there. And it just gives you the from location just for your own convenience, so you don't have to keep it if you just want to uh, see the difference, okay? So that's it. It's quite simple, actually, to use this location manager. It's also quite simple to drain the user's battery in about an hour, okay? So be careful and know what you're doing here. There's a similar API for heading, for tracking the heading. Um, the delegate can report errors, and this is one case, a lot of times you see me in my demos, I just say null for the NS error, and I ignore errors, and sometimes that's okay, like if I'm doing a flicker fetch and if it fails, I just don't care because I know I'm going to be doing another fetch in 20 minutes, so I'll just let it fail. Um, although even there, I probably want to check it, and if it keeps failing over and over, then I need to maybe get the user involved, okay? But here you really want to check the errors. Okay, and again, for time reasons, I don't have to go through time to go through the detail. There's more than just these errors that can occur, um, but there are certain things you need to do in certain of these errors if you want to really be a good core location uh, getting uh, app. Um, 
background. Can you get these location updates in the background? Okay, I promised I was going to talk about this, and I even have a slide about it. And the answer is you can. Okay, uh, you can even sign up to be the kind of app that gets the that your location manager will just run in the background normally. Okay. It's the same place, remember when we went and did the background fetches, we had to go to our project settings and we click that switch. There's another switch there that is location. And when you do that, you'll start getting this, okay? But that's really for apps like uh, you know, a fitness app where you're going off to do a mile run and your phone's in the pocket and it's tracking your progress and you've tuned it to you know, coalesce things and to keep track of it and report it to you. I mean, when you do a fitness app, you can really drain the battery fast. So there's, if you're doing a fitness app, by the way, which don't do that for your final project, but if you're doing a fitness app um, or for the reals, for real, then you really got to know what you're doing. So really investigate that because you really want to be low power, but you can still do a lot of cool things when it comes to tracking where the user's running. However, running in the background like that, since it uses a lot of battery, it's generally only for a very, 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 very small number of apps. But there are two ways to get background notifications about where you are, okay, that are very low power, and they're a little coarser granularity. They're not going to be, I'm running down the trail, telling me exactly where I went on the trail, but they are telling you kind of where you are and are really useful for a lot of apps. So let's talk about the two ways that you can get notified in the background and in the foreground. Okay, if you can get notified in the background, then you're gonna get notified in the foreground automatically. So uh, here's a way that background and foreground, you can get notified, okay? The first one is called significant location change monitoring. And you just get a legal location manager and you can say start monitoring significant location changes. And then when the user moves a significant amount of distance, you will get notified via your delegate. Okay, it's as simple as that. And this works even if you're in the background, even if your application is not running, you will get launched to be told that the person moved to a new space. Okay, this is an awesome API. Okay, very power efficient because it knows how to manage tracking where you are in an efficient way and still super useful for you. The only downside of it is significant distance, right? You have to be going to a different distance. Question. Do we have any control of the definition of significant The question is do we have any control of the definition of significant? Answer is no. Um, so yeah, so when you get launched in the background, if you get launched, like you're not running, you'll get your application did launch, finish launching with options thing will be sent, uh, but there will be a dictionary there. And one of the things in the dictionary will be UI application launch options location key. And if that key is in there, then that means you got launched because a significant change happened. So that's how you know, oh, that's why I got launched. Okay. Because of that key. Okay. Another way to find out in the background is region-based launch, region-based monitoring. Very similar, except for here you actually specify either a circular region or you can also specify a beacon, okay? And I'll talk about that in a second. So you specify a circular region on the planet, you know, coordinate and then a radius around it. And if the user goes into that region, you'll get notified. Your delegate will be sent a message or you'll get launched if necessary and you'll find out. Now, yes, there's a limit to how many of these you can have. I don't know what it is, 40 or something like that, your app. And, uh, but this is also incredibly efficient. So this is happening at a very low power efficient level as well. Okay. Um, the circular region is obvious to create. You just create a CL circular region. The beacon is a little more interesting, and I don't really have time to talk about the beacon. But a beacon is basically not a place on Earth, but it's another device. It's possible to write an application that essentially is a beacon and it's broadcasting all the time. And if your app comes close to it, you'll get woken up and told that you went into the region of that broadcasting device. This is new for iOS 7. Incredible. Okay. I'm really interested to see what people come up with, with this technology. Becoming a beacon is um, here, by the way, is the uh, uh, delegate method you get did enter region and did exit region um, and you'll get launched. Okay, uh, the uh, beacon, uh, it's becoming a beach, sorry, I'm fast forwarding here. Uh, yeah, regions are tracked by name. That's because they have to exist when you're not run launching. There are maximum monitoring distances. Uh, okay, so beacons. Uh, to become a beacon, you need to use the core Bluetooth library. It's not part of CL, uh, the core, li core location library. Um, so you wanna look up CB, core Bluetooth peripheral manager 
and find out if you want to become a beacon. Like you want to be the beacon, not detect a beacon. But if you want to detect the beacon, you use this. You create a region, which is a beacon region, CL beacon region, and uh, you specify a special identifier that identifies that beacon, and then it just tells you when you got close. It'll even tell you how close you are to the beacon. Okay, are you near it or far or right on top of it? Okay, so it's pretty darn cool. So that's regions, region monitoring. So both region and the significant changes will notify you in the background. So MapKit I'm going to talk about next time, and it is basically a user interface for putting these beautiful maps, but obviously we needed that core location stuff to know about how to find out where we are and where things are and stuff like that. So we'll pick that up on uh, Wednesday. And I will see you then. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.